traveling back in time now to the 5th century to a beautiful area in Ireland. I'm actually standing here in a place that's named for the person we're going to tell you about. His name was Patricius. That was his Roman name. Or as you might call him today, St. Patrick. A beloved man called the Apostle of Ireland and known by many of all Christian traditions. I'm standing here in this beautiful area, in an area named for him, Down Patrick, at the church called Saul. It was believed that Patrick began his very first evangelistic mission from here, right where I'm standing in the year 432 AD. Now what's amazing about this mission is it was an invasion of sorts, because think about it. For the very first time, the kingdom of God is coming and appearing in love. The kingdom of God is coming in power through Patrick and the men that he raised up to cast back the spiritual darkness and the druidic demonic worship that had existed here for centuries. You know what? Jesus Christ died for all those druids and priests and people too. So we're going to actually begin our story, not here, but over across the Irish Sea to England, to an area where Patrick came from. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, Patrick was not even Irish. So strap on your seatbelts as we listen to David Cole tell us some more about Patrick. David, of course, is a resident Celtic Christian historian, a man of great knowledge of Patrick. So I asked him in some Q&A about the life of this extraordinary saint. Today with David Cole, a fellow warrior monk. Uh, you are a real monk. You're wearing, by the way, if I was to picture St. Patrick, I don't know how my audience would think of this, but I would think of you. <laughs> yes. You could be a stunt double, perhaps. We saw, we saw some people on the way up, and I think <laughs> they thought we were doing some reenactment shortly. <laughs> this is, this is the, the habit of the, uh, the uh, uh, monastic voyages for the community of Aden and Hilda, which I belong to. And I should mention, we are actually not in Ireland, where you'd think we're going to tell the story of Patrick in Ireland, which of course we are in this film. We're back and forth to Ireland. But today, we are actually standing upon a very unique shoreline directly behind us on a chapel built, St. Patrick's Chapel in, mem in memoriam of him. What is the significance of the shoreline just behind us? So uh, we are uh a southern part of the Lake District uh, in the UK, West Coast now, um, and I think that this is roughly uh, the area that St. Patrick came from. Now, of course, we know he wasn't Irish. He's most famous for being Hold in Ireland. There. Hold it there. Wait a minute. That's why we're not in Ireland filming a, a segment on St. Patrick, because actually he was not Irish, right? No, no. He was a Romano-Brit. He was a Romano-Brit. So what in the world are we doing? every 17th of March in America <laughs> with thousands of people out having green beer and all of this. It's like we're actually celebrating an apostolic evangelistic man of God who was not Irish but gave his heart and his life for an unreached people group. Yeah, so a very significant chunk of Patrick's life was spent in Ireland sharing the gospel and the kingdom of God uh, with the Irish people. But originally he was from, uh, from Britain. Right around these parts? So I, I think right around these parts. So where we are uh, now is part of the, the, the homeward journey on, on Patrick's escape from Ireland. So let's go back in time to, he's about 16 years old. He's taken captive from somewhere along this coast. Yeah, so he was, he was taken captive at around 16 years old, uh, held as a slave for about six years, uh, so into his early 20s, uh, probably herding sheep or cattle or both around the mountains of wherever he was held. Um, and uh, he, he had uh, not really followed the, the faith up until he was captured. And so he really strengthened his faith in the, on the hills over those six years, uh, saying, as he says in his confession, a hundred prayers in a day and uh, the same number at night. Tending flocks was my daily work, and A would pray constantly during the daylight hours. The love of God and the fear of him surrounded me more and more, and faith grew and the spirit was roused, so that prayers, and after dark nearly as many again, even while I remained in the woods or on the mountain, I would wake and pray before daybreak through snow, frost, or rain. Nor was there any sluggishness in me, because the spirit within me was ardent. 
Patrick, 5th century. So the first dream of St. Patrick happened on the Slemish Mountains, just a short distance from where I'm standing today. And I just love the fact that during this time, Patrick was not being uh, still or inactive in his relationship with Jesus Christ. He was passionately pursuing Christ. Let's listen in now on the dream that St. Patrick had after he had been a slave here in Ireland for a number of years that actually led him out by God's direction and a word of wisdom blueprint out of captivity and back home to England. Your hungers are rewarded. You're going home. Look, your ship is ready. And then he has this dream, of course, uh, one night after about six years where uh, God says it's, it's time, to, time to escape. Uh, and it's time to go and your, your boat is waiting for you. Wow. Uh, so he, he escapes his, his, uh, his slavery. He, I believe he runs. He runs, that's what it says. I don't, I'm not sure he ran the whole way. Right. <laughs> it's recorded that he went for 200 miles. So, you know, perhaps he walked and strode a bit. And he finds the boat, convinced that that one that he comes across is the one that God has showed him in his vision. It matched the one in his vision. Uh, and so that's where he goes. He gets on the boat and... Uh, and the boat had some, just a little, little detail, some Irish wolfhounds apparently were on the boat. That must have been quite a ride. <laughs> yeah. So something happened and actually there was some kind of a shipwreck, they, they believe, but he got on another ship yeah. and of all places in the entire world, we're standing on the cliff overlooking the sea where they actually believe St. Patrick came ashore. And uh, yeah, that boat supposedly is shipwrecked um, somewhere in here uh, is where the boat was wrecked. Patrick came up to this spot uh, and uh, founded a, a church here to pray, uh, to, to dedicate this spot to God. So almost home, uh, yeah, here on this space. So this would have been a, probably a very significant place for Patrick on that journey, standing right on this spot. Imagine now the young Roman arriving back home here in this area, this is known as the Kingdom of Reged, and this is the ancestral home area of the St. Patrick. So I can imagine Patrick arriving home to his parents, his hearth and home. They greet him with love. They, they probably are yearning that Patrick will stay home for the rest of his days. And probably Patrick was initially thinking this, but this young, zealous missionary was yearning for something more. And I believe deep was calling unto deep. The fires had been lit of living out a life for Christ in Ireland. And he begins to seek the Lord. Lord, what do you want for my life? And the Holy Spirit answers one night in another dream. Let's listen now to St. Patrick's Journal, to what he records took place, this amazing vision of the night so many years ago. In a vision in the night, I saw a man whose name was Victoricus, coming as it were from Ireland with so many letters, they could not be counted. He gave me one of these and I read the beginning of the letter. It said in my ancient language, Vox Hiberionicum, which translated means the voice of the Irish. While I was reading Ait, the beginning of the letter, I thought I heard at that moment a multitude of people they called Ait, as it were, with one voice. We beseech you, O holy servant boy, come back to us and walk again in our midst. This touched my heart deeply, and I could not read any further. I awoke. Well, this dream certainly would have inspired Patrick to follow Christ in his mission in such a wonderful way. So why was this so unique? Well, I've actually come here. These are ruins of a Roman fort uh, that we're in today in the region where Patrick's family was from. And this is important to remember. This is a Roman time. The Romans had been active here for hundreds of years, really conquering England as far north as the northern border. Uh, the, 
famous Hadrian's Wall, but they had never conquered Ireland. So what I think is unique about this moment in history is we're 400 years past a dream that Paul had, St. Paul at Troas, where the Macedonians, or we could say the Europeans, were beckoning him, come over here and help us. And the first dream that Patrick has as he arrives home is more or less saying the same thing, come over here and help us. That's radical. This is an unreached people group for the most part. Yeah, there were a few Christians around, but the island of Ireland itself had never been conquered by the love of Jesus Christ. Well, it was about to be shaken to its core as Patrick responds to this dream. Uh, Rome was crumbling, but God was opening up a new mission frontier to this people group. So Patrick decides to set out and as he sets out in his little boat, I believe he had passion and fire in his heart. And he takes off across the sea to land in Ireland. And what he begins there is a mission that still has implications down to this day. Here I am today at the Dark Hedges, what's known as the Dark Hedges. It's incredible. It's one of the most photographed sites in all of Northern Ireland. And if you're a fan of the series Game of Thrones, this was actually known as the King's Road, the King's Highway. Well, I think this represents something very unique about the coming of Christianity and the coming of the light of Jesus Christ into this dark culture. If I step a little bit, now I've stepped out of the dark and into the light. Now this was the world that St. Patrick entered. He came into the world of pagan darkness. If any series could represent pagan darkness, I know of none other than Game of Thrones. The, the wickedness, the evil, the sin, the, all of the things depicted in that series could very well illustrate a world without Christ. Did you know there's an old sort of parable that St. Patrick actually drove the snakes out here of Ireland. Well, that's quite a story, and we don't actually know as historians whether or not that's true. There might not have even been snakes in the time of Patrick. Certainly there are none today because of the culture and the climate. However, here is what I think it represents. He comes into a world like Game of Thrones darkness. He brings in, first of all, a full-on devotion to Jesus Christ. He's praying hundreds of times a day. His, his first heart commission is to love the Lord his God with all of his strength and then to love his neighbor as himself or to love all those around him. And so he displays the love of Christ, the power of Christ, even in places like the dark hedges and they become transformed by salvation. He overturned in one generation. Did he drive the snakes out? Yes. If they represent spiritual darkness, he drove the snakes out of Ireland forever. And he ushered in hundreds of years of the glory of God here in this beautiful nation of Ireland. And the nation today is still displaying revivals and people being raised up and trained and sent to the nations. There's still this beautiful atmosphere here, all because one man took a stand for Christos Victor, Christ the victor. And thus Jesus Christ took a stand and his sacrifice of blood was announced here. And no longer did they have to sacrifice their children or animals in blood. Now they believed in the one who came, the God who sent his own son to be the beautiful sacrifice. That's Jesus. That's the God whom you and I serve. And that's the kind of message that transformed this culture in one generation from pagan darkness or the dark hedges into the King's Highway. Back here in Ireland, and I'm actually sitting upon the grave marker, the stone, 
where St. Patrick is buried. I'm in Down Patrick here, and I, I had to sort of take a pause to sort of reflect on how amazing the story is and try to put it in a modern context for you. So here goes. Suppose you are a young teenager. You're traveling with your family over to Iran on holiday, and you are taken captive by terrorists. Now your parents escape, but for six years, you are a slave to that group of people who don't know Christ and who are treating you in such a way that causes you to seek the Lord even more. And one night you have a dream. And in that dream, it shows you how to get to a boat and you escape. You come back to your home, hearth and home, and you're there. And while you're there, you have another dream, and it's the terrorists and the people group in that dream urging you to come over and give your life forever as a missionary and share Christ with them. That is exactly the amazement of the dreams of St. Patrick and his apostolic mission that began here in such power, in such fervor, out of prayer, out of intercession, and then out of evangelistic outreach. That's how powerful the story is, and that's why Patrick, I think he's worthy of raising a glass on St. Patrick's Day to celebrate not an Irishman, but a Roman who became a missionary and gave his entire life for the gospel of Jesus Christ here in Ireland. I'm Carl Wesley Anderson for Love Speaks, reminding you here at the grave of St. Patrick to keep listening. Keep listening. Keep listening! To learn even more about this way or any of the 21 ways to recognize God's multifaceted voice, visit us at lovespeaks.today.